Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Thursday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. For those of you who are here for the first time, my show is all about celebrating artists and their body of worth. And boy, do I have an artist today. He has dabbled in every aspect of the business. Uh, he has been a casting director, an actor, a director, a producer. Uh, he's even done game shows. How many of us can say that? Let's take a look and then we'll meet Robert on the other side. Uh, hula hoops. Uh, Being fast of the fifties. Uh, worms, bugs. Creepy crawly things. Uh, a big leafy tree. Green things, full uh, things, rich uh, things. Uh, things in a forest. Tall buildings. Uh, towering things, uh, uh, high things, a, tall things. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sunglasses. Uh, sh things that make a shade. Yes. Uh, uh, banana sundae. Things that are fattening, things that are desserts, rich a, things. A uh, 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 divorced couple. P things that are separated, split, things that are yeah. split. Uh, I get excited every time I watch that. And not only, you know, what is so interesting, it's one of those full circle moments. Uh, yes. Because, uh, first of all, Anita Gillette, who mm -hmm. I hope she's watching because I am absolutely in love with her. Oh, me too. She's more in love with my husband than she is with me. She, <laughs> oh. she tells me all the time. Uh, but anyway, hello, Robert Neil Marshall. How are you? I'm great, Richard Skipper. What a beautiful way to... I haven't actually watched that clip in a while, so it was like, wow, that was a very upbeat moment. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, before we delve into your life and career, mm -hmm. um, uh, not to put a pall over everything, but it's mm -hmm. hard to believe, but tomorrow will be one year ago that all of our theaters shut down. Broadway, cabaret, concert venues across the country. And I wanna ask you, how are you doing really in the midst <laughs> of all this? I've, I've been very lucky in the sense that um, I, I've been working lately as a managing director as the, of the Columbia Festival of the Arts and the Columbia Film Festival. And, and that kind of happened because we were a live festival, Lakeside had to do with thousands of people coming out. We couldn't do any of it. But, but I had started the Columbia Film Festival, which we could go virtual. So I've been very busy um, mm -hmm. in, in, in throughout this and blessed that I at least be able to have some sort of steady income coming in. So we've been trying as best we can to employ other people and find ways to help and supplement artists and, and so forth through the festival. But it, it's been tough. My, my, my husband's a flight attendant with American Airlines. Um, I, hope I, can I want to that. talk about that for a moment. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we will. But I'm just saying that yeah. he's out there in the world. So, you know, I'm isolated. Um, he had COVID back in July, but very mildly. But I didn't seem to get it, I guess. Um, so because uh, I was testing negative um, and no antibodies. So uh, it, but it's tough. I mean, it, it, it like. I'm in this bubble. I go out, out, and and there's this world of people driving and doing things, even here in Maryland. And I'm like, what are they all doing? These crazy people, you know. But I, I get into my groove, my routine, my computer. Yeah, you know, I miss hugs. I miss, you know, that. I mean, talking like to Anita, we're we're very dear, dear, close mm -hmm. friends now as well. And um, you know what she's going through in New York, and you talk about what you do with your career and. You know, again, we have so many overlapping friends. I know we joked about that mm -hmm. a little, but you know, to know what they're doing now. Um, so 
I'm more scared about how is this because we talk about how are we going to reopen mm -hmm. and, and Maryland just literally yesterday, the governor in Maryland said we can reopen everything pretty much as it was. And I'm in Howard County and our county executive went along with that. And there are people going, whoa, 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 hold on. So what do we do? How do we navigate this? How do you navigate a festival when people are anxious to go outside and see things live? Same thing with theater. How, how do you how do we maneuver this and when? Mm -hmm. Well, I want to ask you, what did your calendar look like uh, on this date last year uh, before everything shut down? And what are your earliest thoughts and memories about hearing about COVID last year uh, as everything was starting to shut down? It, it's interesting. Um, and, and this ties in with some of our mutual friends. Um, I've been friends with Caroline O'Connor for decades and decades. We worked together in the West End of London as kids. And, you know, she went on to do some stellar things and we've been close. I was in Chicago last year when she was doing a show. A, she played Madame Zinzani in Chicago at this wonderful sort of cabaret thing she was doing. And she was due to do it through March. And I went to visit her. And this is when they were getting word, we're gonna shut down and mm -hmm. things are gonna close. And she had to go back to Australia. It was like, how do I get out of the country properly and do all that? And her husband, Barry, who's also a musician and a producer, Barry had to go back to London first because they had things with the house that they were trying to close down. And so that was when I, it really began sort of like, wow, like people have to leave the country. People have to get out, things are shutting down. We talked about the festival then like, it doesn't look like we're gonna go live, but mm -hmm. this is what we can do. So it was, you know, you get into you get into to, to tunnel vision. Like, what do we do to 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 keep this going? So honestly, Richard, that was kind of what I remember. And my last flight on an airplane, and I used to be able to travel all the time. And being married to a flight attendant, you know, <laughs> it was coming back from Chicago a year ago, over over a year ago now. Well, this is all about you today, but I do want to ask you. Mm -hmm. Um, how did this affect his business uh, at first? Uh, was there a period of time where he wasn't working? And oh, yeah. as a couple, because I asked this of all couples, yeah. uh, were you spending more time with each other than you had ever had in any other point in your lives? And if so, how did that affect the relationship? No, that's a great question. Um, we 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 navigated it well because there was a period of time when he was home for a period he was off when he was sick mm -hmm. he had to take leave he had to quarantine but he wasn't really sick i think he had a fever one day he was really lucky compared to other people we we actually just lost a board member at the festival a wonderful woman named laura weatherald and sorry uh, to covid it was it, tragic and such a beautiful lovely soul too um so it, it's it's hitting closer to home with a lot of people in in many many ways now more than it did in the beginning Beginning. But um, for Craig, he was home and it was good. I was glad he didn't get really sick. I was nervous about what would happen, but it was like, I'm okay, you know. Uh, and and we can touch on this later. But I'm uh, part of what I did is, and you may ask me this later or not, but I, I did a documentary called Back from the Light. I'm a near death survivor. I don't know if you knew that. Not I didn't know that. That's amazing. Uh, back in 2013, August 3rd, I had a massive heart attack and was clinically dead a minute and a half, and they resuscitated me, and it sparked a whole series of things. So. I, and the reason I bring that up now is that the concept of my own death is sort of in compared to other people, my family, the people I care about. So when he had to go back to flying, it was very, very limited in the beginning. But then they just started pouring all these passengers on the planes. And he says, these flights are full. And um, lately it's been packed. I mean, he just did, you know, the, the Miami, um, Miami turns out of D.C. going down there with all the college students you know, spring break. So a lot of people are acting like the world is just- I know, well, and, I'm not one of them, not yet. I, mean, I live 25 minutes north of Manhattan and uh -huh. I, I have not been in Manhattan since yesterday marked one year. Wow. So was last yeah. year. Uh, but I wanted, I want to ask you, I know that you were born uh, in Baltimore, Yeah. Uh, but you grew up in New York and we'll talk about your family uh, growing up in a moment. But what was it that took you back to, uh, uh, you know, you're in Baltimore or outside of Baltimore now? In Columbia, yeah, Maryland, Columbia, between Baltimore and DC. It's a beautiful, very open, artsy uh, community. It was built on by the Rouse um, dream, the vision of, of equality and diversity. And uh, it was something very rare to find. 
Um, long story made very short. Craig and I, I, after I worked in, in London and did all my West End stuff, I came back to the United States, was trying to acquire the rights to a particular musical. We can talk about it or not. Early and, modern and early. On the on the flight, yes, <laughs> on the flight to Los Angeles is where I met my other half, and we lived in LA. I ended up moving there. I just come back from England. New York was cold; it was damp in England. I'm like, this is sunshine. This is beautiful. So I moved to LA, and we lived there for many years, about six, seven years. And during the Rodney King riots, decided to come back. Now, my my mother, my blood father, uh, is now deceased, but my mother married this guy. Um, young, right out of, you know, she was just going to college, first marriage. She ended up divorcing him two years into the marriage. So she was a single mom, a single actress in New York trying to survive. She was on Broadway, did all of that as well. There's actually a picture and, of your mom. Yes. Oh my gosh, <laughs> you are prepared. Yes, yes I am. <laughs> and that, that's gorgeous. That's never too late with Arthur Godfrey. Yes. Um, and uh, that was th that's where I made my Broadway debut. I could share that story with you as well. Um, it, but it was unofficial. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, anyway, so 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 my mother remarried, and and then she married Paul Marshall, who is my adopted father now. Um, and so it was this whole relationship of, you know, being in New York and being in L.A. But I had family still here in Maryland. I used to come to visit, and when I came, we had to get out of L.A. after the Rodney King riots. We said Craig was laid off with from T.W.A. The business was in upheaval. There was all these changes. Rodney King, the economy was was really difficult. And I'd visit my dad and go, my God, Maryland is so beautiful. And I sort of, I ended up coming back to the place of my birth, nothing to do with theater for a while. I took a hiatus and met somebody who said, oh, you do theater. Would you like to direct a local play? And I'm like, oh, I haven't done that for years. And guess what? a little fuse in there boom it's like you're 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 back i'm i'm an i'm a, I'm, a, I'm a theater alcoholic i guess you could say a theater <laughs> addict theater holic ho theater holic once it's in me i i can't get it out you know so i know i mean you were born in uh, baltimore you uh moved to new York, but then you grew up in inglewood uh am i correct uh which is very yes. Where I live, in Bergen County. Yeah, my my parents. We I grew, I grew up in Manhattan for many years. I went to professional children's school. Actually, um, Matthew Arkin was a buddy of mine, and we reconnected recently over Facebook. It, it's it's amazing the friends you can reconnect with. Um, so I went to school in in New York in Manhattan, a prep school on the East Side. I was a West Side kid, um, and then my parents moved to the suburbs. Um, my dad had a law firm. He's copyright law. In, in Manhattan on West 57th Street, just down from Carnegie Hall. And um, actually it was the same building as um, um, uh, Chafee, I'm sorry, Ro Rollins and Chafee, uh, uh, Willie, um, uh, I'm, I'm going blank on his name now, my God, he's the actor, Woody Allen, Woody Allen's agents were in the same building there. Uh, and there was also a madam on the top floor, I, I remember. It always is. <laughs> yes, because, because I, as a kid, I would get in the elevator and these guys would smell of this rich oil aroma. And, you know, it's like, uh, what is going on? You know, <laughs> God, what strange memories. Anyhow, so we moved to Englewood, New Jersey. And then eventually my parents moved back into Manhattan once the kids were out of the house and moved on to downsize eventually moved to Florida. So um, it was a period of time. So I grew up in my high school years in, in the suburbs. Um, B and Liz Alda were classmates of mine. Alan Alda came to see me do a play with that opposite his wife. We, we did um, Goody Proctor, um, the, the um, you know what I'm talking about, the, the um, uh, I'm having a senior moment now. No, I, well, I have them too, so. The, 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 play, the play about the pilgrims and, and the witches. Oh, um, uh, uh, the Crucible. Crucible, yes. Yeah. God. The Crucible, yes. yes. We, we, did, we did the Crucible, and Alan Alda came, and he was like, you know, came to see the show because it was his daughter was Goody Proctor, I believe, and and you know, at the end, he said, "Oh, you did a really fine performance." I'm like, "Oh, gee, thank you, Mister Alda." You know, and he um he ended up speaking at our graduation too. I'm class of '78, so that's um when and he came to talk then and i remember sitting in a math class and this girl's writing her alda is written all over her 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 book and i just remember saying you aren't related by any chance and she goes yes he's my father you know like that <laughs> well i want to ask you your mom was an actress your father mm -hmm. dealt with copyright law yeah um and was there a specific defining moment for you where you said this is the path i want to take mm -hmm. and what was the response from your parents well, that's interesting. 
my my grandfather, my mother's father, was a newsreel cameraman, and he had a film business that, after the war in Chicago. That then my uncle did my early film production work, and I got to travel a lot with with them. I was going to school at NYU, um, getting my my film degree, and working for my uncle. Uh, and my grandfather, uh, no, my grandfather had passed away then, just my uncle. I used to get these, you know, my paychecks from the accountant um, and she would go, I bet economics class is pretty boring after flying in helicopters for the Marines. And I'm going, yes, it is. I want to go work. Um, but uh, no, it, it was, um, I'm sorry, what was your question? You know, uh, about your parents' response to you wanting to go into My response to it. So with my grandfather in the business and things, they they brought me in very early to be in some of these movies when I was a kid. And I, my earliest memory actually was playing a pilgrim child, funnily enough, we're talking about pilgrims, pilgrim mm -hmm. child in a Thanksgiving movie um, where um, my cousin and I were little pilgrim kids together. And I just remember, you know, being on the set and being in these costumes and that smell that's in a studio and and just being hooked. And then in school at PCS, we, we I remember being in the HMS Pinafore. And I remember wearing my blue sailor pajamas singing, we sail the ocean blue. And I'm not a, I'm not a, I've done musicals, but believe me, I'm not like our Broadway members. I am not the ones that can sing. <laughs> And people say, Bob, you can sing, you can sing, but I don't have the confidence that um, I think some of our, our real pros obviously have. Um, but that said, Richard, that's kind of started it. And my parents were never, even though they were in the arts and in the business, they were like, no, you need to do something else. You need to do something, you know, that's going to make a living and, and you can rely on, which, which always bugged me. I'm like, you're all in the business. But they were always saying, well, that's why we know it. So I know. Was there any particular path that they wanted you to take instead of going into the theater? I that's that's interesting. They they never just as long as it wasn't theater. I that they was never my parents in that. <laughs> my my other career would have been an airline pilot. Um, I that was aviation is my second mm -hmm. deep deep love. And um, I, and I've done things with aviation over the years, historical things, and flown on vintage airliners, and done video, you know, little low budget documentaries and tours, and ocean liners and ships of transportation. So I think I would have gone into that. I was a travel agent for a while, um, just while I was going to school to make some money on the side, so mm -hmm. I could write tickets and pretend it was like I could go somewhere on an airplane. But it was just an office job. But it, 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 I I think it was more. Just think of something productive that might make you some good money. It was more that in the beginning. Now, right yeah. after high school, you went right to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And yeah. what were, for you, uh, the pluses? And were there any minuses uh, at for that period in your life? Were you auditioning oh. actively? You know, what was that time like for you? Well, that, that, this is very interesting. I, I, I had a teacher, God bless her, and if he, anyone watches this later who might remember, Martha Robinson, she was this grand lady and she always talked in high school and one of the acting teachers, my days at the academy and the academy this and the academy that. So uh, I was with Marge Fields back then, Dorothy mm -hmm. Scott, um, and I came this close to like one major, major role when I was a kid that just the other guy got it and there it is uh, for it was jaws 2 the sequel for that and um but you know the the agent said to me then i work with michael baird at wilhelmina talent and and and, and michael was like bob you you've got to get some training here you know <laughs> if you're going to do this uh, you know and i was still a teenager so i just said well you know this is the end of high school how about the American Academy of Dramatic Arts? I mean, that would be a great way to do it. So I auditioned and got in and my parents at first were like, why don't you go to a real school, you know, like mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. and I got it. Um, so, but I got in and in fact, I remember during my callback in this guy's office, I'm doing this monologue, like a Shakespearean monologue or something. I'm what, 17, 18 now, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just 18. And these two pigeons are copulating on the windowsill. <laughs> outside the window like while i'm doing and trying to keep my focus and he knew that that was happening and so it was a very funny moment you know like after the audition i got in i was there for two years in the program mm -hmm. i met some really lovely wonderful people good classmates good stuff but um and i work with carol Fo fox prescott if you guys know carol mm -hmm. prescott yeah. carol was one of my teachers i loved her forever we even brought her down here to maryland to teach in some workshops with some of my associates here uh, I adore Carol, some of the best technique in the world. But Carol was tough on me, you know, and Carol said, you have to decide to learn. Are you going to audition 
or are you going to stick to the learning process? Because the academy has this very strict rule. You cannot be auditioning. But I had an agent before I even went there. And I'm I like, want to talk about that for a moment. Do you think yeah. that's a good policy or not? It's a tough policy because I came into it having a certain degree mm -hmm. of experience at that time. I had done a number of industrial films, a couple of small commercials. I'd been on a set. I clearly needed to learn. I knew that. I mean, and certainly looking back in hindsight, like, oh my God, yes, I, I really needed that training. Um, but I think that it's part of it. I think it's part of it. As long as you don't get overwhelmed to, to the point where you're not focusing on your craft and it's all about the business. But mm -hmm. that's the, my problem with it. They don't teach you the business of it. It's all about the art. And I'm like, you know what, guys? It's a real world out there and you need to learn how to navigate this. And nobody teaches you. No, well, you know what? Yeah, that? Right. Weist Baron. Weist Baron I, was the best training for that. I did soap opera classes with some wonderful people. I worked with Michael Ingram in some classes as a teacher in the TV commercial classes. Mm -hmm. They taught you the business, you know? Well, what are some of the things that you did glean from your time there that mm -hmm. have uh, shaped you in terms of both your career and your, uh, and your personal life? At the Academy, you mean, or in me? Yeah. Um, the Academy, um, well, I mean, just the the skills, the confidence of 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 that, um, knowing as much of what's BS as much as what's real. You know, I, I always remember this one class where, you know, I was very literal as a I am as a person anyway. I use it in my warped sense of humor is literal, and sometimes I just take things literally, and I don't get things that other people seem to just have no problem with. The class was you're laying on your back, our eyes are closed, and we're supposed to just destroy the room. OK, that was the exercise. And I'm laying there and I hear people around. This is like that, you know, like like the the, the we don't have bobsleds in San Juan kind of a story. I'm laying there and people are grunting and they're groaning and they're banging on things and they're and Carol comes standing over me. And I'm, I'm laying there concentrating very hard on what I'm doing. And she goes, you're not doing anything, Robert. Why are you not doing anything? And you know what I was doing, Richard? I was in my mind, I'm going through the building and I'm wiring it very carefully for explosives. And I was just gonna bomb the whole place and with one kaboom, blow up the place. I was doing the exercise you know, in my own great, way. <laughs> there's a great anecdote that uh, Nathan Lane was in one of his first acting classes and he mm -hmm. paid $300 to be in the class. And mm -hmm. everybody had to go to the window, look out the window and imagine something that was out there outside the building. And then uh, imagine being that object or uh, mm -hmm. being the like, birds or whatever it was. Right. And uh, he went to the window and he stood there and he stood there and he stood there. And finally the professor or the teacher said, so what do you see? And he says, I see $300 floating away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there were better teachers than others, you yeah. know, in other things. And some of them had been there forever and they had these wonderful reputations. Some of them, you know, but you got a flavor. The nice thing about the academies, you got a flavor of a lot of different techniques. Mm -hmm. You know, I found that, you know, I was much more into the visceral sort of emotional connection thing as opposed to, you know, close your eyes and imagine this and then, you know, just, just, follow through step by step. I, I I just let go when you get into something. And if you just want something, believe in something, let it matter to you. And just be yourself is the hardest thing I, I think it was to, to trust and to believe as an actor. And shortly after that, you went off to London. And uh, let's talk about uh, your reasons for going to London uh, and uh, what that experience was like for you. Because well, that took you to a whole new level in the business. Oh yeah, that that was really a breakthrough. And, and I think to this day, because of the friends that are still friends and the work that I've done, it, it, you know, I'm working with people now through the film festival that I've met and that I've worked with and, and a project that I'm working on now that that is like full circle. It's like everything in your life at a certain point comes together, just everybody on, on when and where and how. I actually went to Germany first uh, for a summer. I worked for a, a German film company um, for as, as a, actually they made me like script supervisor. I didn't speak a word of German, so I didn't get that. Mm -hmm. But but it was like what they did and I, they would translate the, the script for me every single day before we would shoot. But the funny thing is, it was a Heinrich von Kleist novel. It was like 
1800s German. So it's the only German I learned. So I would think I'm learning and I'd say something in German and they go, oh no, Bob, we don't say this anymore. That's a very old way of saying this, you know? But I, I worked there for a while, didn't have, and this is this is pertinent to the story of getting to England. Mm -hmm. So I, I did that, um, didn't, didn't uh, couldn't keep a work permit, couldn't get a work permit there. So after the film was done at the end of the summer, like, Bob, we'd love to keep you, but there's no work. So I, I went back home. And what am I going to do? So a dear friend of mine that you might know, his name is Rob Roth. And Rob is the director of Beauty and the Beast. Rob and I have been friends since way before he was famous and did all that stuff. And um, Rob used to do word processing, you know, and he said, look, Bob, you want to make some money? He says, I do this for some of these law firms and things. You want to make some money if you can type, do the word processing. So I got a job working for American Express Publishing, doing that and working for that company. And while I was there, this is in the early 1980s, right? They had this uh, flight simulator game and this big mainframe computer. Simulator game was on a brand new thing called a PC, right? Yes. And um, I worked for a company at that time called Tiger Temps. Okay, yes. I bet we, we, Richard, I don't know how we don't know each other from back then. I mean, we may have even had dinner together. We may have dated. I don't know. <laughs> we may have. <laughs> it <laughs> wasn't the same. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but so anyway, but yes, like like a temp agency like that, same thing. And so the, I, because I loved aviation and flying, I bugged this woman. Can I please, after hours, just play with the simulator game? She goes, "All right, Bob, just just leave me alone. Just go do it." I started to learn the computers that way, and then she saw, "Oh, you've got an aptitude." She started teaching me more. So. I got this opportunity. I was going to be a flight attendant with American Airlines. That was what I was going to do. I had applied and I had my interview for like September of 1984. And I had an opportunity then. I went over in the summer for an interview with Richard Armitage, who was a friend of the family's. He had known me for many years, but it was an internship. It was all it was going to be. And they took me on and said, if you'd like to come to England in September, we had to work out you know, how this was going to happen. Um, so I left America's Press Publishing because this was in my field, what I really wanted to do. So I never went to the American Airlines interview where I would have been an old senior senior flight attendant by now had that happened. I want to ask you a question, speaking of which, I mean, there are those of us that are very driven by the business of show business. Right. Uh, and did you have that intense drive or was it just that you felt that there were other things that you would have enjoyed doing more? I had a drive for it, but at the same time, it was kind of like things happened in certain orders that dealt with survival. Mm -hmm. It dealt with opportunity. And I was driven all my career, which is maybe why I'm not perhaps more famous <laughs> or whatever that is in this business. But I've always, A, I've always preferred behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I enjoy performing. I think it's good to practice what you preach because I've, I'm I'm I've been a teacher and a coach, you know, just to get through. And you have to gig in this business. We know that once one show's done, mm -hmm. then what are you going to do? So you have to, I've always learned to keep that survival mechanism and what can you do? And then you can make a living through these things until something hits. There've been a lot of projects that, okay, we built this, we built this, we built this. It gets to a point and then something, is it that I'm not good enough? Is it that something just didn't click? It, whatever, but but then things are good. It's just the timing is right or it's wrong. So I would say everything builds on it. So working towards things was a drive, but it was also the fun of it. And this is what it was. And also some things, Richard, I thought were going to be more permanent working for Richard Armitage, I mean, this was a wonderful start. And we were talking about my coming back to the United States at some point, potentially, and working out of Ralph Roseman's office for Theater Now, who was yeah. the general manager. And I was going to run the US office for Noel Gay, art, you know, Noel Gay, um, you know, theater, theatrical, mm -hmm. you know, having having done that, you know, working with David Cole and Guy Kitchen and, and all these guys in London. And Richard Armitage, younger than I am now, he was 58. He upped in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and he probably had the same thing I had. Probably went into V-Fib. He had the Widowmaker. Probably never knew what hit him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I came into the office the next day and Carol Yule, who was our, our switchboard operator, we had these old, it was like Lily Tomlin's operator. Yeah. Back then, yeah, you, you only could get a temp that was like 90 years old because they were the only people who knew how to use those phones. Absolutely, yeah. And, and Carol had tears just coming down her face, and I thought, oh my God, what's wrong? And, and Roberto Germains was this wonderful agent that worked there, and he did all the 
incredible like Asian circus acts and these incredible, almost like what you would find in America's Got Talent kind of things, but he would tour them all over the world. He was an old guy. I thought, oh no, Roberto passed away. And she said it was R.A., was Richard. And, um, and from that moment, so many lives and careers just changed like, like that, so. But you, so you're in London, you're working as an intern, you worked yeah. on uh, Me and My Girl. That was uh, a big. Let's talk about the, that journey, uh, <laughs> being involved in that production, coming to New York, it opened the Marquee. The Marquee Mar was the first show at the Marriott Marquee, yeah. 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 Um, that whole uh, time frame in your life and what was going on uh, with you both professionally and personally. Well, I I had been dating an actor who I'll really leave nameless here, who's been with another actor now for many many years of my life, um, who was in the in the show, um, in the original cast of Me and My Girl, uh, a sweetheart of of a human being, and we're still good friends today. But I guess the timing was just not right. But it was a year and a half together, so I, I'm motivated a lot by my heart. I will tell you that I go by my heart sometimes more than my career, and that's good because I realize now after things that have happened to me, it really is that heart, it's that soul, it's who we are, what we give, and what we learn and what we share, I think is far more important. Well, I also than think that by going with your heart, uh, you have opened yourself up uh, to so many opportunities uh, that would not have happened uh, if you were solely focused on that prize of show business. Yeah, no, it was never the prize in that sense. For me, it's always been about the work. It's been about the journey. And I don't regret anything. I have had a blast. If I were to have another near-death experience or a final experience right here this minute, I would say I, I've, I'm, I've lived a good life. I feel blessed for the opportunities right. and things that I've done. I, I felt that when I died the first time back in August. And this is all, like I say, bonus time right now. And then what am I still here for? What am I supposed to do with this? And that's that's more of a motivator than then it's some golden ring somewhere. But um, in, in England, it, it really, I came in as an intern, but I had a lot of experience with computers. And what that did is when I had to apply for a work permit there, they, there were people in England who had already had a lot of computer experience, even though they were brand new, but they didn't have a lot of theatrical experience at that time. There were people in other industries or there were people who had a lot of theatrical experience, never touched a computer in their lives. So I actually got my work permit because I had both. I had the theatrical background and the computer background and they interviewed a ton of people. They had to by law. And that's how I got my work permit. But while I was there, I automated the, the the offices where all of their investor management systems that were all handwritten checks and things, I actually could track it in spreadsheets and had this system. I brought up this laptop, this portable thing I, I got for the office that would print out checks and things. And RA was like amazed that we could do this. You know, like, well, ask Bob. He's the, you know, the, the computer whiz kind of a guy. So it was business. But I also learned a lot from him about investment, about mm -hmm. budgets, about management. I would sit in a desk. This is what interns did. I sat in a desk in his office, listening to conversations. He would actually, even though I had no legal experience for that third eye, he would give me these contracts, you know, like for major Broadway show negotiations. And I'd be reading them and I'd pick out things that just logically I said, well, it doesn't make sense here. Or they're talking about something as simple as, well, this is how much will be paid at da, da, da. But I said, well, we're in the UK. It's some, is it US dollars? Is it British pounds? And, and at what exchange rate? Would that be? Well, did you uh, get any of that information from your stepfather, or was this just something that was there? No, it was something that was just there. It was logic. It was from doing things from going to NYU, from doing budgets as as a film major, and having to come up with you know several thousand dollars to to make a film that way. You know, uh, when I first did it, and and and, and it's a up and now in Arizona. She's a wonderful filmmaker. She There was this guy came into a sound editing class. There are 27 filmmakers, 27 filmmakers. You talk about wanting to grab the prize, okay? Mm -hmm. They all were going to be famous filmmakers, right? A uh, sound editing class, guy comes in, he says, uh, we need someone to put away trims on a feature film. And now trims today, it's all digital. But when you cut a, a 35 millimeter film, you know, and a 35 millimeter, not just the little 16 millimeter. This was like big feature film movies, like get my hands on real movie stuff that that they they, they have these little pieces that are cut pieces of nitrate plastic. And they're in these bins all over hanging hundreds of pieces. And you got to take these pieces and find the reels that they're all time coded, cut it, put the piece back, reel it up, put the next piece back. So things that's electronic. You don't think about it today. Well, you had to learn that hands on. 
Out of all these 27 filmmakers, three of us raised our hands to, 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 to do this menial, terrible job because all I heard was feature film, right? Mm -hmm. And I went in and when I met with Jeannie and I had this interview, I said, Jeannie, I said, I don't know if I called her Jeannie then, but you know, I said, there, how come out of this class only three of us raised our hands? She says, those are the only three that might have a chance at making it in this business. You know, and my uncle always said too, any of the filmmakers that came in, Haskell Wexler, I believe, worked for him as an intern years and years ago, started with him. He said, you got to be willing to clean, sweep up the floor to do that. That's and right. I learned that early on and I never mind. It was never about, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a filmmaker. I go to NYU. I don't, you, no, 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 no. So that's, that's I think, part of my background of, of how to, to do that. And um that that was a, a powerful effect and i learned and i listened and i had fun watching it all come together and that's when while me and my girl is running and i'm working and i'm doing all this working with both general management and richard was an agent as well richard was emma thompson's agent and um, you know all of these um, um, um hugh laurie and stephen fry i mean all of these guys these were all kids it was amazing back then who they were, you were. surprised at the success of me and my girl in the united states you know what? It was such a fun show that it, that it, and and I was like, oh, I can't wait till my friends back home can see this because this was so British. It was such a British thing, and I'm I'm the Yank in the group, and you people loved me and tolerated it because I was a Yank. But um, and and everyone was convinced that Les Mis at the Olivier Awards was going to win, you know, in London, and you know, and they, I love these guys. Don't get me wrong, I love them dearly, and we all, you know, played softball together. I started the softball league. I brought America to to England for a while. But we all played together, but there was fierce competition and, and everyone was convinced that they were gonna win Best Musical. And me and my girl won that year. Robert Lindsay won. Right, that's right. Faye Dunaway, Faye Dunaway announced it. I'm like, and I'm still sitting here like, uh, celebrity didn't really do anything to me. And, and Richard Armitage had said to me, Robert, if you get the slightest twinge around a celebrity, you're not me. Other people that it's all about the first nights and the day says, that's not it. It's about, you know, and I learned early and, and I said, yeah, I grew up with my father and some of his clients in the industry. I grew up around people in the business. So it, they're mm -hmm. people. I respect them. I, I was never, oh, you know, so so with that being said, um, it was this this whole general attitude and energy of just get on with it. But me and my girl won and Faye Dunaway was there and I was going, oh, my God, that's Faye Dunaway. So I did get a twinge only because this is real. This isn't just this little microcosm because even though Emma is huge now and Hugh Laurie and Stephen are huge mm -hmm. now, right? Rowan Atkinson, huge. Back then, they were huge That's in right. England. Right? They weren't known anywhere else yet. So I like, this is like this little mini world of these sort of fake famous people, but they were all doing really cool things. Who knew? And when we made it to Broadway, um, I, I was not surprised that Les Mis was going to win on Broadway, but Robert still walked away with the the Tony and, and, and we won uh, several accolades for it. Well, there are so many areas of your life that I want to touch upon, but one in particular mm -hmm. that I really want to talk about is, uh, well, you know, and this is how you met your husband as well. You were flying out because you were in negotiations with Universal uh, yeah. for uh, Thoroughly Modern Millie. Yeah. Now, before anyone uh, jumps ahead of our story, uh, the Thoroughly Modern Millie that you were working on is not the Thoroughly Modern Millie that no. came to Broadway. No. So, um, first of all, when, where, and how did this all come about? I mean, was it just your love of this film that you wanted to see this as a Broadway musical? And how far did you get with everything with this? Well, it was quite interesting. Um, we, first of all, to give you a little backstory to it. Yes, I always loved Thoroughly Modern Millie and my grandmother had the album, the old album cover, the actual one and with the drawings with, you know, Julie Andrews and, and um, Mary Tyler Moore with the, the kickstand. And I always loved the music. And I know, I know she's a dear, was a dear friend of yours and, and with Carol Channing, you know, the jazz baby. I just, I loved <laughs> all of it and, and the raspberries and, and the whole thing about soy sauce. And, you know, we, we can go down the road with that. So there was something about it. And, the, and I remember going to Universal Studios as a kid and seeing the elevator that they did the dance in. I was just like, this is magic. 
Well, back up a little bit. So I'm I'm in I'm in New York before I went to England, and um, my father had done a lot of work with Clive Davis many years ago uh, mm -hmm. as one of his music clients, uh, and I got to go to the first um, uh, read through of a show called Is There Life After High School? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff right. Kinley, Ray Carnelia, um, and it, it, Sandy Faison was in it, and and really. It, the show had issues, problems, but musically it was powerful and wonderful. And um, I'd always loved that as well. Mm -hmm. So now move forward. I'm, I'm in England. I'm working with all these wonderful actors. We were sort of on a steady cruise. We were beginning to build for New York. And, um, you know, I, I would love to do this. And, and my other half said, I love this musical. This is the most beautiful music in the show. So I said, let's do it. And that's when Richard said, I will invest some money in this and you have to raise the rest of the money. It was an exercise. It turns out it was an exercise to see what I could do. And um, I had to raise a, a fair amount of money. We got the Dunmore Warehouse. Nika Burns was then the artistic director and she's gone on to all sorts of crazy, wonderful things. But um, he gave me this exercise. It was like a late cabaret, really, apart from it, but it's still West End. Several actors from multiple shows came together and... Um, we made a profit, you know, on the run, on a limited engagement. And Richard said to me, I was expecting to lose all my money and you gave it to, you gave it to me all back. So then after the, the popularity of me and my girl in this period piece, um, I started to think about this would be a wonderful musical. And I've always loved Thoroughly Modern, it's never been a musical. And this is what, 1985 now we're talking mm -hmm. about? So I started working on it and I reached out and it was Music Theater International at first and they, and, and Richard Morris and, and he'd been sick, he'd had cancer, then he came out of cancer. So uh, it was all of this talk where I was going to work with Mike Ockrent. Mike was interested in coming oh. on board potentially as director because he was the director of Me and My Girl. He, I hadn't worked with Susan yet uh, at this point. I hadn't met her. I, hadn't had, I don't believe had knew Susan, he was still married to, to his previous wife. Um, but uh, talking about Martin Johns, who was a set designer and and a, a lot of the creative team of me and my girl saying, look, maybe this is a next big musical, we could pull this off. So I started working, my father's office helped represent me uh, for legal purposes and getting the rights and securing them. And But you have to get the film rights as well as the stage rights, as you well know, to get backing on anything. So I finally, uh, after a lot of back and forth, um, I got this meeting set up with Richard Morris and uh, with one of the attorneys in the Black Tower at Universal. And I had helped Richard Richard Armitage at this point negotiate for also High Society that we were we had worked on um, that was with Natasha Richardson. Natasha Richardson. And um, I left and Richard died before that came to fruition, but it was already well underway at, at the Victoria Palace, also through the Lester Haymarket Theater. And we were talking about the same route for something like Thoroughly Modern Millie, maybe to do it in that direction, not go right to Broadway with it. Mm -hmm. So I knew the people and, and, and they were like, this is a great idea. Let's get the rights, let's make it happen. Long story short, Richard Morris, I think was so excited and anxious to get this done. And I, I, I that, that I think he, he suddenly thought, well, now if these people are interested. Now I can get big, big, big money for it. So instead of a smaller sort of deposit or down payment, the money got astronomical beyond what was reasonable. When I went in, to uh, the Black Tower, the attorney that I met with, you know, I was 24 years old then. Now, if you're 24, you're hot stuff. I mean, everybody thinks you're the hottest new producer. When you were 24, this was an... Guys and rates and, and percentages and having just worked with the, the Cole Porter estate, you know, for, for some of these songs and the Philadelphia story, I knew what, what was reasonable, even though I was a kid, and this was off the charts, like, all right, we need to keep negotiating. And long story short, it kind of fell apart. I kind of fell in love. Um, I went back to me and my girl on the national tour for a little while on the West Coast, you know, just while things were happening. And it, it just, they wanted so much money that they were looking elsewhere. And I said, I can't compete with this. You didn't even get, I mean, you didn't get beyond just the negotiations. You didn't have a creative team in place as you were putting this together, am I correct? We had a creative team that were willing to be attached to the project. That's what we had. And there were talks and discussions about that that were very real. We did not ever get to the point where we had the rights 
and then we're going to go ahead. That's when it fizzled. And years later, when I, I wrote Dick Scanlon, I said, you know, congratulations on this. And I said, I, I want you to know that uh, there was a dream here and this is and I'm so thrilled for you. And he wrote me a lovely letter back and he says, I know that there were many people who tried before me or there were others that tried mm -hmm. before me and that it was it was a very difficult process. And and it's interesting because I've done some lectures on different shows and we talked about I talk a lot. I, I work with Kinnar. That's how I know Jerry Sager, gorgeous Jerry Sager. Um, and, and Bill well, Miller. Sorry. And Bill Miller. And Bill Miller. Oh, God, of course. Wonderful Bill Miller. Well, so and Bill's how I I, I, I did his documentary. And that's also how I, I got to start lecturing 12 years ago for Kennard. But mm -hmm. one of my talks was on the um, My Fair Lady, the whole history from the Ovid poem. Right. I love the story and, and, and how it came in. We talked about how um, like Pascal, he had to die before his his movie could be made, even the straight play. And it's how artists sometimes are their own downfall it, it, with their own work and and it was kind of like god bless richard morris because he was a he was a genius in what he did do but there were problems with thoroughly modern i mean there were storylines that started that never went anywhere they were great for a movie but if you really follow a logical line things started but where did that come from what was it how did they tie together and and so can you imagine it even being uh, getting to that point today in this yeah. pc world that we live in <laughs> yeah no, a lot of projects would never, ever have happened because of that. But so, uh, you know, Richard Morris, God bless him. He, he apparently he had to die before even Dick Scanlon's version came together. Mm -hmm. I understand. Richard, before I when I met him, he already had written an entire script it was ready. I have it. I have it on my shelf here. Right. Mm -hmm. It'll never it'll never see the light of day. You know, maybe I'll share it with you if you if I can dig it up, but it will never go on eBay. It will never see the light of day. But he had written a script already to go. and was it needed a little work you know um was it going to incorporate the songs in the movie uh more so yeah, than a lot of them and then we songs and and things it was was the, the, the I always thought you know what a shame that they didn't bring carol in to play mrs mears in that production wouldn't that have been something would have been wonderful but you but you want to know how a new friendship started which was kind of crazy one of the other people that i thought about and then i ended up I, I saw her in one of her own shows when I was just a fan and then formed a friendship with her. And that's where Gret Gretchen Reinhagen was my original du um, duchess in uh, a, a production of a musical that I wrote that was at the Edinburgh Festival. But she did it at Boys Choir of Harlem. So, so Gretchen was in there. But I read Gretchen because um, uh, Kay Ballard was who I oh. one of the people I was originally considering for Mrs. Mears. And she was interested had it happened because this was all around the same time when this was brewing. And um, so not that that would have happened or would have necessarily been right, but that would have been on. But yes, if Carol had done something live on stage, had she re reprised that role, my God, it would have been a dream. It would have been but amazing. You met your partner, your life partner. Uh, uh, flying out to LA for that meeting. <laughs> um, you know, before we run out of time, we have to do, sure. we have to do a full circle here. Um, you were on this game show with Anita Gillette. Yes. Um, and then years later, the two of you are working together and becoming friends. And mm -hmm. how did that come about, you know, going, you know, moving forward in your life? This this is the crazy thing about how life overlaps in the crazy, crazy circles about why you, sometimes you do something, you don't know why you're doing it. And then it suddenly makes perfect sense later on. So I'm lecturing on the Queen Mary. It's one of my early, early episodes. I just started doing that. And this gentleman comes over to me, a British gentleman. He goes, hey, I say, would you mind meeting my friends over here? And I, they, 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 they enjoyed your talks today. I would love to meet you. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Obviously, I'd be, be happy to. So I walk over there and a bunch of Brits is what I thought. No, nothing against Brits. It's just they were all British subjects. And I thought, and there's this woman as I'm walking over, sitting there, gorgeous, red hair, you know, and I'm thinking, <laughs> this looks a lot like Anita Gillette. And... I was just like, I've never had a chance to say thank you because she really, it was an incredible experience. And I'm, I, I paid for my student thesis film with the money that I won on that game show. No, she That's was good at it. I mean, oh were, my God, she's wonderful. She's or not, you know, so. No, she's wonderful. She so, I said, I, I said, so I said, Miss Gillette, I said, I said, I just want, it's so nice to meet you. I said, I just want to say that you and I were on a game show together back in 1981 and you changed my life. And she says, oh, honey, come here. Give me a hug. You know, she's like, Anita. 
she says, come, come sit down, sit down here next to me and talk. And she's the only Yang because her, her boyfriend, David, he's, he's British. Yeah, so that's yeah, why they're all together. They were traveling on the Queen Mary together. So we began and she's talking. also from Baltimore. And she's Baltimore, hon. Oh my, <laughs> no, I knew, I knew. It's the whole thing. And, and so as we began to talk with each other, we realized how our lives had, that had overlapping circles of friends, although we never got to work together, mm -hmm. but we had, and we started talking and she knew a little bit more about me that I had produced and things that I'd done. So we just started chatting. And then she, we started talking when she was working with Barry Kleinbord about, you know, I know, cause I've seen you, uh, we've met briefly at times yeah. at some of her shows. And, and she was talking about this new after all that they were talking about. They didn't have a title yet, but, and I said, Anita, I said, this is story of your life. I said, I, I know all these people down in Baltimore. I said, let me produce this workshop for you if you want to try it out. And we got Jock, um, oh, what's his name? One of the, the Baltimore Sun articles about her, got some early press and we brought it down to Baltimore, packed the house, people loved it. And then I produced a workshop down in Florida for her. We flew her down there that was a, a community sort of gathering and, and produce, and it got it on its legs. So I've always been involved with her one person shows helping her. And then we've been, I've helped her all along with these things and with her computer stuff and with her website and just, and we're just good friends. I just adore her. She's like, she's like my mom now. Oh, I, love, I love her dearly. Uh, yeah, me too. I love you. Um, and then I want to talk about your casting. Uh, you, you uh, worked also in casting in Baltimore. Yeah. Um, did you enjoy working on that side of the fence? I, I did to a certain degree. I will tell you, um, it, it's a tough job. I mean, to do. Um, I learned some wonderful skills and I think my acting work definitely contributed to that. And I, I think Let me I've got ask you a question because a yeah. lot of people, what do you think the biggest misconception is that people have about casting? <laughs> I don't know. I think that people, it's like, they think that it's like, it's a power trip, like casting directors are going to be able to pick and choose and, and, and whatever. And, and there is a certain degree at times of, you know, favorites that casting directors have, but ultimately casting directors, as you know, generally don't make those decisions. They can influence them, but it's the directors and the producers that do it. We're kind of like temp agencies for actors in, in many ways. And I don't mean to downgrade it, but you need to have a good eye and a good match for things like that. Um, and Susan Allenbach was a dear friend of mine from LA. Um, and Susan, um, we used to work at California Association of Realtors doing like computer work together. She came back to Baltimore, ended up working as John Waters assistants for many years. Mm -hmm. And I needed some work. And I said, Susan, if you hear of anything, let me know. She goes, well, you know what? Pat needs somebody to help her with casting as a casting associate, casting assistant. You think you'd be interested in that? And I said, I'd be happy to talk about it. I love theater and film and stuff. And uh, Pat Moran, my God, with her history, yeah, The yeah. Wire and all that. So we went in and Pat and I started talking about the um, the ocean liners and my ships. I wasn't talking about theater or film. She's like, Robert, you were on the QE too? I just love ships. It was one of the best places I'd ever been. And I'm like, yeah, Pat, I love I loved the ships. And she says, well, when can you start? I can't pay you much, but whatever. Little did I know that that is the world that happened. Um, that we're going to come on board, but you know, and uh, it, it was an art. There's an art to it. There's definitely an art to it, and I've been able to do some other mainstream casting apart from that. But very proud of being able to fit the pieces together and know know the body of actors and say to them, "This is who we have." Like working with um, Jay Roach when we were doing Game Change, for example. There's one actress I will give her a shout out, Jill Redding. She'd done smaller parts on, on The Wire. She was a bartender in a, mm -hmm. several series. She, she was a pretty well-known, but small local actor in that respect. And there was this part, I don't know if you remember in real life when with McCain at this convention and there was this larger white haired woman that came out and she said, I don't trust this Obama, he's an Arab. And he goes, no, no ma'am, I'm sorry. No, oh, no, of course I remember that. Very famous moment. Well, Jill Redding was like perfect for this part. And among all the other casting things, I said, Pat, I, I know exactly the actress for that role. And Pat, look, she's, oh my God. So, and then Jay Roach was like, my God, this is genius. And she got the part, like hands down. Mm -hmm. And she did a beautiful job in the movie Game Change. And a lot of, we, we cast like a lot of the day player roles, the smaller, all the children we did the casting for. The, the starring roles were, you know, uh, done out of LA with David Rubin and Richard Hicks and stuff. And then when Veep came along, um, you know, um, Julia was in the office, Armando Iannucci, they all came in and were really lovely people. 
Um, at the end of that, we didn't really know that the show was going to be a huge hit. I mean, obviously it was, but we finished the first season. It was months before it happened. That was in 2012. And we had um, the Titanic. I did a lot of stuff with the ships, as I said, and I was invited by Bill Miller to go on one of these ships to the actual site of the Titanic sinking, 41 North, 50 West, on the 100th anniversary of the Titanic. Oh, wow. Wow. And I said, and I said, Pat, I need to take a brief leave of absence, if that's all right, <laughs> and just to, to do this. And she's like, Robert, oh, I understand. And because the production had shut, finished for season one, but they hadn't aired it yet, it was like, okay, you know, there's not going to be a lot of money coming in. She was happy for me to take a break. I did that. And it was an incredible story and, and an experience, uh, spine chilling. But then um, I came back and I had done some side work with the Columbia Festival of the Arts. And it turns out that they needed a new programming manager. And the programming manager was just like a casting director. But instead of casting actors, I'm soliciting and looking for bands and musicians and musical acts. And you go to APAP and you you meet all the agents and you find these things. And uh, it paid much better than casting did. It was a steady job and for a, a well-established organization. And that that was my my entree to to that world. So it was like doing what I was doing. It had a it had a flow. It made sense. It just wasn't mainstream HBO anymore. It was a smaller mm -hmm. organization. And I did that for a year. And literally three days after that contract ended is when I had my heart attack. And I life and my body and all sorts of things and that's where my career just kind of it, it did loops and other projects in between that's how kismet i think well, things i can't believe this but we are at the end of our show but oh my before, gosh you know, but before we go i want to ask you what would you say <laughs> to this kid oh god <laughs> believe in yourself that you can do anything you want and you are not you're not the insecure person that you felt you were, that just believe that you can go out there and be bold and stand up for yourself and believe that you have a right to do anything like anybody else does. And you can be that complete person. That's and every, every young person should believe that. Believe well, that Robert, I, I've enjoyed this so much. There's so many other layers that we didn't even touch upon today. We have to bring you back sometime if you'll come back. I would love it, Richard. Thank yes. you. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here today. If you enjoyed the show, I hope you did. Uh, please uh, tell your friends. Uh, whatever platform you're watching or listening to this on, please leave a comment. And if you happen to be watching this through Facebook or another medium, please go to my website, richardskipper.com. Sign my guest book with your thoughts about the show. That does help to boost me into the markets. I want to let everyone know that I'm taking tomorrow off, but I'll be back on Saturday with Sammy Goldstein. Speaking of cruise ships, he's been working for years on the cruise ships, and we're going to talk about his life before the pandemic and how he's going to be going back. So I'm looking forward to that. I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and the second name that pops up, reach out to that person with a phone call and let them know what they mean to you. Not a text message, not an email, not an inbox private message, but an actual phone call. Because as my dear friend David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you never know what someone else is going through. Robert, I once again want to thank you. Anything, I'm going to give you the final word. Um, anything that you want to expound upon that we talked about today? Uh, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had? Or just any message that you want to put out to everyone? This is your platform to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. You're so sweet. And thank you, first of all, just for having me on the show. This is an immense pleasure. I look forward to talking to you off screen or on more in, in any respect. But I would just say for everybody, you know, we're here for a reason. We're here to, to teach and to learn and to grow. So feel that light, feel that calm, feel that love, embrace it in your life and give it out. It will come back to you tenfold, a thousandfold. Now go out and make it a better tomorrow. Thank you. Goodbye, Robert. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.